Well, good morning, everyone. I'm John O'Neill, one of the pastors here at Grace, and it's a delight to bring you the uh, uh, message for today, this All Saints Sunday. Well, a Sunday school teacher uh, one time asked a little girl in her Sunday school class, what is a saint? And they happened to belong to a big church, and they had in their sanctuary had all these beautiful stained glass windows, and each of the stained glass panels was a different saint. And so the little girl thought a little bit, and then she said, well, a saint is someone that the light shines through. That's a pretty good answer, if you ask me. In fact, I think that's a great answer. So today is All Saints Sunday. It's, it is the day that we set aside on the church calendar when we remember the saints. But who are the saints? Who are the saints? What do we mean when we speak of saints? What is a saint? Well, the majority of people in our culture fall into basically two categories in their understanding of the word saint. Either it's totally out of a secular framework or it's out of the Roman Catholic faith. We've all heard people use the word saint to describe a really good person, right? Well, she's just a saint. Well, you know, he's been a real saint lately. You know, we hear People talk that way, and in some circles, the word saint is simply a synonym for a really good person, and it really has no religious connotations at all in this case. Now, that's the secular use of the word saint. The second way that we understand uh, the word saint comes out of the Roman Catholic tradition. Here, the word refers to a certain number of men and women who have been singled out by the church and identified as saints. St. Christopher, St. Patrick, St. Nicholas, St. Jude, those are some of of the more well-known of these popular chosen few. Now, I'm not going to say more about the secular use of the word saint. That, that to me, is just a misunderstanding of what a saint is. That's a misuse of the term. However, I do want to at least begin with the Roman Catholic understanding of the saints and then kind of move out from there. So how do Roman Catholics understand saints? Well, I ran across a little book in my library entitled, What Catholics Believe. Every Lutheran needs a copy of that book. Okay, What Catholics Believe. Well, in the chapter on saints, the author described the formal practice for recognizing men and women whose lives gave special testimony to the grace of God. This process is called canonization. Okay? Now, what are the requirements to be canonized as a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the first requirement is that the person must be dead. I know that's not very encouraging for some of you that would like to be saints, but that's the first requirement, okay? You have to be dead. The second, the prospective saint's writings are carefully studied by a special committee at the Vatican in addition to hearing the testimony of living witnesses who can vouch for the holiness of this particular person. The committee also looks for special signs of God's favor toward the person in the form of wonders work during his or her lifetime. And finally, there must be at least three verifiable miracles attributed to this person as a result of the person being prayed to uh, by someone. Okay? Now here, by the way, is one place where Protestants and Roman Catholics differ in regard to their understanding of saints. Protestants do not pray to saints. We understand that we have direct access to God through Jesus Christ and in his name, and therefore there is no reason to have to go through saints. We don't need the middleman, so to speak. Well, when all these requirements are met, then the person is officially recognized as a saint and given a day on which his or her life of faith is celebrated. Now, in medieval times, every aspect of life came under the protection of saints. Just about everything you can think of. You may remember from last Sunday that Martin Luther cried out to St. Anne when he was frightened by a thunderstorm, right? Well, he cried out to St. Anne because St. Anne was the patron saint of minors, and Luther's father was a minor, so that was kind of their family patron saint. Sailors and fishermen addressed prayers to St. Nicholas. St. Geneva cured fever. St. Blaise was known to relieve toothache. Did you know that? St. Blaise, and and St. Hubert guarded against madness. I figured that that St. Hubert was the patron saint of pastors who teach confirmation. (laughs) Okay, and so when all else fails, 
you pray to St. Jude because St. Jude is the saint of last resort. Yeah, true, true. Each season of the year came under the protection of certain saints, and each church came under the guardianship of a saint and took on his or her name. There were more than 25,000 saints venerated in the Middle Ages, and much of it, to be real honest, boiled down pretty much to superstition. Well, that's not so much the case today, but it certainly was during the Middle Ages. Well, how do we as Lutherans, how do Lutherans understand these special saints? Do we, do we recognize them at all? Well, we do recognize these men and women of faith in a special way, and, and, uh, and the, uh, we, we, we certainly celebrate All Saints Sunday in the life of the church, right? Like we are doing today. Now, our church does approve of giving honor to the saints, and this honor is really threefold. There's kind of three ways we do that. Uh, the first is thanksgiving, okay? We should give thanks to God, that God chooses to give his gifts to the church and that there are, there are faithful men and women who use these gifts to further the work of Jesus Christ in our world. The second way we honor the saints is for the way that they strengthen our own faith. For example, when we read that St. That Peter was forgiven for his denial of Christ, then we realize that, that our own sin cannot separ separate us from God's love either. Okay? And the third honor is, is imitation, first of their faith and then of their other virtues resulting from their life lived out of that faith. Well, things have, have, have kind of changed in the Roman Catholic tradition since the Middle Ages, and they have a much more healthy, I believe, understanding of the concept of sainthood, which is kind of more in line with the Apostle Paul's referral to all believers in Jesus Christ as the saints or the communion of saints. In that same little book about what Catholics believe, I found this, this, the following statement, which I think is really a good statement. It says this, By far, the most important qualification for sainthood is in the everyday living out of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Pretty simple statement. Pretty clear. I like it. So who were some of these more famous saints? And were they always holy and righteous? I mean, was this, was this always the way they were? Well, no. They were ordinary people, just like, just like you and me, sinners to whom Christ came into their life. And for some of them, their early lives were anything but virtuous. For example, St. Augustine, the great St. Augustine, he carried out a, a, an affair, long affair, and fathered a child, even though he wasn't married. St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, he started out as a bloodthirsty soldier. He was a nasty guy. And St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi, he spent his adolescence in drinking and partying. These people did not become saints in the true sense of the word because of their own works and virtues, but rather because they received Jesus Christ into their life. They received the light of Christ. And a saint can truly be defined as one through whom the light of Jesus Christ shines through. Very simply, the word saint means holy or blessed, which brings us to the gospel lesson for All Saints Sunday. I want to concentrate on the first of these Beatitudes, since this is the key to understanding what it is to be a saint. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. First, let me give a couple of general comments about the Beatitudes. When Jesus first preached the Sermon on the Mount, he didn't speak them these words of the Beatitudes in, in English or even Spanish. He didn't even speak them in Greek. Jesus spoke them in his own native language, which is Aramaic, a kind of a dialect of Hebrew, sort of common Hebrew, as it were. Now, we do lose a little in the translation from spoken Aramaic to written Greek, and then translated into English. The Hebrew word, which is often translated blessed or blessed, in the, especially in the Psalms, is an exclamation. Okay, it's an exclamation. You can always put an exclamation point behind it. And so the Beatitudes are not simple statements. They are exclamations, often translated, oh, the blessedness of. Okay? 
Oh, the blessedness of, of, uh, uh, of, of being a Christian, of living in Christ. And this is not referring to some future event at the end of time. It's the blessedness which exists in the here and now. It's not something into which the Christian will enter at some point in time. It is something to which he or she has already entered into. So the Beatitudes are actually saying, oh, the bliss of being a Christian, what joy there is in following Christ, or the sheer ecstasy of knowing Jesus Christ as my Master, my Lord, and my Savior. The very form of the Beatitudes is is a testimony of the great joy and the gladness of living the Christian life. It's, it's it's, It's an exclamation. So if the word saint means holy or blessed, then a saint is one who has received the blessedness from God and lives in the fullness of joy, knowing he or she has received that blessedness. But what does it mean to be poor in spirit? That's an interesting phrase. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Now, how can we be filled with such blessedness if we are poor in spirit? I mean, doesn't being counted among the saints mean that we are filled with the spirit and spiritually rich? Isn't that what that means? The word used for poor here describes absolute and abject poverty. It means to be completely poverty-stricken, to be destitute and totally void of resources. The Hebrew or Aramaic word for poor went through a four-stage development in meaning. The word began by meaning simply poor. It went on to mean because poor, because poor, therefore having no influence, no power, no help, and no prestige. The word went on to mean because having no influence, therefore downtrodden and oppressed by humanity. And finally, the word for poor came to describe the one who, because he has no earthly resources whatsoever, puts his or her whole trust in God. That's that's the development of this word poor or poor in spirit. So as Jesus spoke these words in his own native language, he would have been referring to the humble and helpless one who puts his or her whole trust in God. To be poor in spirit, therefore, means to recognize that without the spirit of the living Christ, we are all spiritually bankrupt. When we recognize our own spiritual poverty, how utterly hopeless and helpless we are in spirit without Jesus Christ, it is then that our lives become like that beautiful stained glass window through whom the light of Christ shines through. This is what it is to be a saint, to have the Lord Jesus Christ fill our spiritual void with his light and life-giving spirit so that we become living images of God's presence to one another. So the interpretation of the first beatitude and the goal of a saint becomes kind of one and the same. One commentator put it like this. This is kind of an expansion of that first beatitude. I kind of like it. He says, Oh, the bliss of the person who has realized his or her own utter helplessness and who has put his or her whole trust in God, for thus alone he or she can render to God that perfect obedience which will make him or her a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Today we celebrate all saints, whether they be from Grace Lutheran Church or St. Philomena Catholic Church, whether they be from Des Moines or Federal Way or Kent or Seattle or Uganda or Haiti. We celebrate those through whom the light of Jesus Christ has shined. Amen. Thanks for watching. I hope this video can further the discussion of your relationship with Christ either at home or maybe in the comments below.